Okay. I think I'll go ahead and start the introduction slowly, and then the, we may have others uh, come on as, as we get going. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our first lunchtime talk of the spring term, uh, as it is still snowing outside my window. I don't know about yours. Um, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Jacob Gates Foster, 2021. Uh, Infosys member in the School of Social Science. Uh, Jacob earned his undergraduate degree in physics from Duke University and went on to receive a master's in mathematics from the University of Oxford and then a PhD in physics from the University of Calgary. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at UCLA and an affiliate of the California Center for Population Research the Center for Social Statistics and the Bright Center. In addition, Jacob is on the core faculty of the Center for Behavior, Evolution and Culture and serves on the executive committee of the Institute for Digital Research and Education. A computational sociologist, he is interested in the social production of collective intelligence, the evolutionary dynamics of ideas, and the co-construction of culture and cognition. His empirical work blends computational methods with qualitative insights from science studies to probe the strategies, dispositions, and social processes that shape the production and persistence of scientific and technological ideas. Using machine learning to mine the cultural meanings buried in text, and computational methods from macro evolution to understand the dynamics of cultural populations. Foster also develops formal models of the structure and dynamics of ideas and institutions with an emerging theoretical and empirical focus on the rich nexus of cognition, culture, and computation. He is founding co-director of the Diverse Intelligences Summer Institute a program that aims to build community, collaboration, and creative thinking among early career scholars interested in the study of mind, cognition, and intelligence of diverse forms and formats, from ants and apes to humans and AI. Jacob is currently writing a book on knowledge as an emergent feature of complex adaptive systems. We are so pleased that IAS this year, along with his wife, Erica Cartmill, also a current scholar in the School of Social Science. He is going to speak with us today about the science of the possible. Um, please go ahead and mute your audios. If not, we will do it for you. And uh, we look forward to some uh, discussion after the talk. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. Uh, introduction, Pamela. I, since this is, you know, on the official record, I have to correct two things. One, which is uh, uh, self-effacing and one self-aggrandizing. The self-effacing one is that I did not actually finish my degree at Oxford, a sore point uh, <laughs> in our family, um, but it all turned out well. Uh, the self-aggrandizing one is that I uh, am now an associate professor. I was tenured this last year uh, and really need to update my departmental website, which is annoyingly difficult to do. So in any case, um, I am so thrilled to uh, be here today and honored to be speaking to all of you. Um, before beginning the substance of the talk, I just wanted to say that this really has been for me the fulfillment of a dream that I have had since um, being a, a quite young uh, child when I read this book, which I picked up at a local book fair. And uh, you can tell I was quite a weird kid that this was a book that I read and it's about the Institute and formed this dream from a very young age to come and spend time here. And so the 25 to 30 years later, uh, it is wonderful to finally be here uh, and to fulfill that dream. So before I dive into the theme today of a 
social science of the possible, I want to start with a kind of framing question. And that's first to ask what this sequence of images I'm going to show you have in common. So here's the first one. There's a second one. And there's a third one. So uh, I think many of you will recognize uh, all three of these since you've been coming to these talks. And uh, to answer what the first two have in common, I am drawing on the insights of the physicist and astrobiologist Sarah Imari Walker, who answered the question uh, in terms of the first two as there being ideal systems for studying particular phenomena that appear in those systems in a particularly extreme form. So many of you, I think, will have recognized the first as being an image of a black hole. And black holes are ideal for studying gravity because that phenomenon is brought to its sort of extreme case there. And there are many folks at IES who use black holes as laboratories for the study of gravity. The second image you may have recognized as a bacteria, specifically E. coli. And Imari Walker argues that they are ideal, uh, that living systems are ideal for the study of information. And once again, Stan Leibler, who I actually met as a graduate student in the School of Natural Sciences, has done really beautiful work using this precise model system to show how survival depends on the extraction of information from the environment. So what, obviously you recognize this is a group of human beings. Um, so what is it that our object of study in the social sciences, uh, the groups of humans, what does society provide the perfect model system for? And I wanna offer two answers to that question. One is the social production of some kind of collective capacity. And two is the emergence of uh, or introduction of radical novelty into the world. Human groups excel all other known systems in our ability to bring the new in to being. So in this talk, um, which is a version of a talk that I actually gave uh, in the School of Social Science this year, um, I want to talk about a contribution towards social theory, which is what I view myself as doing. Um, I'm gonna give some empirical illustrations, but uh, what is the kind of contribution that I, have, I, I want to make? And what is it that I mean when I talk about theory? Well, as Pamela mentioned to you, a lot of my work centers on studying science as a system that socially produces collective intelligence and knowledge about the world. And so I'm gonna draw on some work in the social studies of science to answer this question of uh, what do I mean when I talk about theory? And in invoking theory, I really follow the wonderful historian of science and physicist, David Kaiser, who in this book, uh, Drawing Theories Apart, which I highly recommend to you, describes theory, even the kind of very lofty theory practiced in the School of Natural Sciences here by the, the you know, folks who are high energy theorists, theory in its most crystalline form, even those theories are less rigid, coherent structures of ideas and more a set of tools for solving problems. And I wanna suggest that those problems that we use theory to address have two basic forms. One is problems having to do with explanation and understanding what is. And the other is enhancing our imagination what might be possible. And of course, imagination and understanding are intimately linked one to the other. 
the great Brazilian American social theorist and legal scholar Roberto Mangabeira Unger tells us that to understand a state of affairs is just to grasp what that state of affairs might become under certain provocations or with certain circumstances that we impose on it. So imagination and understanding are in this view very tightly linked. So towards what end do I want to contribute towards this toolkit for solving problems having to do with the nexus of understanding and imagination? And the contribution that I want to make has to do with building tools for social scientists to move from studying what is to what could be, a social science of the possible, of possible futures, of possible worlds. And my inspiration uh, in doing so comes from a really beautiful little essay on the quote unquote end of physics that Robert Dycraft, the director of the Institute, familiar to all of you, uh, wrote uh, a few months ago. And so if you have not read this essay, which was in Quantum Magazine, I encourage you to read it. I'm going to quote the relevant part here. All of this is part of a much larger shift in the very scope of science from studying what is to what could be. In the 20th century, scientists sought out the building blocks of reality, the molecules, atoms, and elementary particles out of which all matter is made, the cells, proteins and genes that make life possible, the bits, algorithms and networks that form the foundation of information and intelligence, both human and artificial. This century instead, we will begin to explore all that there is to be made with these building blocks. So with emphasis on these two aspects, the social production of collective capacity and the birth of radical novelty, I want to take up this theme today, the move from studying what is to what could be the reimagination of the social. And in doing so, I'm going to share with you three tools, three conceptual frameworks, which often bring with them some formal machinery, some empirical methods that I have encountered and been enchanted by in my own uh, journey across the disciplines. As Pamela mentioned, I was trained as a physicist. Um, I have been pretty uh, borderless in my wandering across the, the landscape, looking for inspiration uh, to bring to bear. And in talking about each of these tools, I'm going to need to reintroduce them to you. Because in many cases, particularly for those of us who have who are in the social sciences, some of these ideas carry certain connotations that aren't what I mean, and so we need to kind of rethink uh, their meaning. And so the first is the idea of computation. The second is the idea of evolution. And the third is this notion that is maybe the least familiar uh, called construction, which I mean in a certain technical sense coming from evolutionary biology. So I want to begin this task of reimagining what we think about when we think about the social world through the lens of computation. And here, I don't mean computation so much as a technical method. In other words, the kinds of things that computational social scientists like me use to kind of find patterns in social data at large scale and at large complexity, as in using neural network methods to mine meaning from text, which is something I do a great deal of in my empirical work. Uh, instead, what I want to talk about is computation as a set of ideas that are relevant to theory, relevant to our conceptual toolkit for thinking about the social world. Now, for some folks, computation is a bad word. For many social scientists, it smacks of determinism, of necessity, of rigidity, of symbol manipulation. And that is not what I mean when I talk about computation. In the sort of contemporary sense of computation, what it means are just 
procedures for arriving at adaptive decisions based on information that's approximate and noisy, to quote my collaborator, David Krakauer, who's the president of the Santa Fe Institute. Or to give an even more general definition with good IAS provenance, Avi Vigderson in the School of Mathematics describes computation as the evolution process of some environment by a sequence of simple local steps. Now, of course, that is a extremely general concept. So what I really want us to take away from computation as one of these three inspirations is a sort of style, a way of thinking about a problem. And that style, among other things, um, is reflected in this really beautiful book, Vision, by David Marr, the uh, computational neuroscientist. Um, and in this book, Marr describes three levels for thinking through and trying to understand an information processing system. These Marr levels are valuable tools for computational thinking. And so he says, we can try to explain these things on three different levels. On the level of computational theory, where what we focus on is what's the problem that's trying to be solved by this system and the broad strategy for doing so. The level of representation and algorithm, which is saying like specifically, how are you representing your input and output and what step-by-step -step procedures, what algorithms are you using to go from one to the other? And then the third level is the hardware implementation level, which says, okay, how are these things actually instantiated in physical things in the real world? And note that these are three distinct levels of looking at and explaining something. And it's important to address a question at multiple levels because they obviously inform one another. It's also important to understand how uh, and when one is asking a question at a particular level. Now, I think the fundamental benefit of computation for a social science of the possible is that computation is in its sort of purest form in the sort of theoretical computer science sense, the science of what is possible under various constraints or limitations of time, of memory, of resources. And I think it's worth making a comparison here with the kind of typical social science of what is possible under constraints, that is economics, which in its most orthodox form is committed to particular models for the computational primitives, human beings, and committed to particular paradigms for arranging those computational primitives into larger systems like markets and institutions. And so in that sense, I think computation allows us to imagine a much broader scope of possible configurations, possible social arrangements, possible institutions um, compared to our kind of standard way of asking those sorts of questions within the social sciences. So to give you one example, so I'm going to try to illustrate each of these conceptual tools with uh, um, example. I want to talk to you a little bit about how thinking in this computational way can help us understand a particular kind of uh, challenge that falls broadly under the scope of what's called reinforcement learning. So this is an idea from uh, artificial intelligence that's very useful uh, and actually has many similarities with how we often think about human uh, action and behavior. And the basic idea here is that an agent encounters some situation, it has a method for proposing an action given that situation. You take the action, whatever you do, you know, do you turn left or turn right? Do you break or not? That shapes the situation you find yourself in next. And periodically you get some reward that's kind of telling you how things are going. That's the reinforcement part of reinforcement learning. And based on these trajectories of taking actions in different situations, you 
update this procedure that you have for connecting situations to actions. And this basic tool is what has been behind so many of the amazing successes in um, uh, deep minds work uh, for in, for example, playing video games, uh, in uh, playing Go and so on and so forth. So broadly speaking, the approaches to the reinforcement learning problem traditionally fall into kind of two classes. One is what's called model free, which you can really think of almost in the sense of habit. You know, you're in some situation and you just have a sort of, without having an explicit model of the world, you just have some things that associate either an idea of what would happen if you did a particular thing in that situation, or just more generally, in this situation, you should do this thing, and so on and so forth, right? So riding a bicycle is an example of this kind of very habit-driven, model-free approach to the problem of, you know, getting from A to B, including with some novel perturbations, like having a, a dog riding on your shoulder. And then the other broad approach is what's called model-based. And in that case, um, really what we are uh, thinking about is solving the problem through deliberation. So this is the kind of archetypal economics way of thinking about uh, this problem. It means that you have some system that tells you okay, if I do this, this is how this is going to change the state of the world. I have some knowledge about what taking this action in this situation produces in terms of a reward, and so on and so forth. But what about novel situations? What about situations where you have very, very little experience? Well, it takes experience. It takes learning to build up these habits or to build up these models. And there's some very interesting neuroscience um, that's beautifully described by uh, Gershman and Daw uh, in an annual review piece that sort of suggests that in this situation where we don't have a lot of experiences, we need a different approach to solving the problem of deciding what to do. So um, often there is a distinction made uh, in thinking about our memory, our storehouse of, you know, information about the world and information about what to do that uh, divides it into so-called procedural memory, uh, things like knowing how to play the piano, things that have to do with using our bodies, often very habitual knowledge formed through extensive experience and semantic or declarative memory, which you know, has to do much more with the kind of explicitly represented, more symbolic, more consciously recalled information. It's roughly parallel to model free and model based. But one of the things that's been left out in accounts of memory in certainly uh, the sociology literature that's tried to take up this thinking more seriously about the cognition that's evolved, involved in producing um, competent social behavior is the idea of episodic memory, specific experiences. Um, and so uh, one way to deal with novel experiences, uh, and this is the so-called episodic reinforcement learning approach that Gershman and Daw develop is to use those memories, to use this episodic memory of specific experience. And I want to suggest going even further that we can deal with novel experiences using stories. And here I'm deeply informed by the work of Art Frank at the University of Calgary, who is actually my kind of original mentor and inspiration in becoming a social scientist. And let me tell you a little bit about how stories might work. Now, we all understand the power of stories these days, that stories are really um, important and essential for getting people together and getting them to act in a coordinated fashion, whether it's you know the kind of Reddit stock purchasing behavior or 
you know, things like QAnon. Um, so we understand the power of stories these days, but how do stories actually work? How do stories shape collective behavior? So I want to suggest a very simple model in which we have two ingredients, stories and similarities. And in the simplest form, you can think of stories as just some state taking some action and then getting some reward. And similarities are ways of basically saying, I'm in this situation, how similar is this situation to this story that I have in mind? So you can imagine an agent who has some sets of stories that they've heard, whether these are totally fictional stories um, or whether these are accounts that someone else has given them of experiences that they've had. And based on this similarity function, they select the stories that are most similar to the current situation and use that to sort of weigh the consequences of taking different actions and then choose their actions on that basis. And what I want to suggest, this is something that I've you are hearing sort of fresh off the mental presses, so to speak. This is something I've started to think about um, since coming to the Institute, actually in like the past month and a half. Um, so you are hearing the very first time I've ever talked about this. Um, people can coordinate their behavior in novel situations. They can arrive at, you know, what seem like some kind of equilibrium or some stable set of coordinated behavior when they draw on the same stories to guide their action and when they have some agreement in their judgment of what stories are relevant, in other words, in their similarities. So that's an example, I would contend, of how computation can help us think through the social production of some kind of collective capacity. And we've seen plenty of illustrations of how stories can do that practically. Um, in the past like two months. But what I want to suggest is that computation can actually help us think through in a more um, uh, explicit and formal way when you would expect people to use stories to guide their behavior um, and how that might actually concretely and explicitly work. Okay, so I'm going to turn now to the next case which is reimagining the social through evolution. And just to forewarn you here, because uh, I want you to see a little bit of what the kind of empirical work I do looks like, there are going to be some figures here. But the reason that they are there is so that when uh, we have some Q&A, oh, the power has come back. Um, so. Uh, and uh, great. Can't, okay, so now I can stand up. Um, Pamela, are you still seeing my screen or are you seeing my yes. presenter? Yep, yes. okay. perfect. Okay, great. This is, this is much better. Okay, animation level is gonna turn up because I can stand up again. Okay, <laughs> so, um, I am putting these uh, empirical slides in here in a second uh, so that if you want to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of how this stuff works, you can point to them, I can go back to them, and then we can talk about them in, in some detail. So, okay, when I talk about reimagining the social through evolution, if computation is kind of a bad word in the social sciences, evolution is a really bad word. And it's a bad word, among other things, because of people like this guy, Herbert Spencer. And Herbert Spencer, um, as you may know, has promulgated a kind of confusion about social evolution that essentially confounds evolution in the sense that, you know, Charles Darwin meant it and that we use now and the notion of development. And so in the social sciences, evolution is often taken to refer to these so-called stage theories, which basically say like all societies start like this and move through a sequence of stages and of course always end up looking like some 
Western European civilization that the person promulgating this theory happened to live in. Um, and so this is not what we're talking about. And this is also not what anyone means um, who uses the idea of evolution these days. One way of thinking about evolution is as a kind of inference, a way of learning about the world. Um, my colleague Jessica Flack from the Santa Fe Institute talks about it in this way. And there's actually a very beautiful literature that shows how evolution in the sense of Charles Darwin actually is deeply analogous to uh, Bayesian inference if you've encountered that set of ideas. It's a very beautiful connection that was only understood quite recently. So I want to talk about evolution as a special kind of computation that takes place when you have some population of things, when there's variation within that population, when the inheritance happens, so the properties of one item are broadly correlated with the properties of its offspring, and differential survival. Now, as describing evolution in this very generic way can suggest, we can use it to meaningfully analyze and understand social and cultural systems. And what I wanna argue today is that evolution provides us with a new way of making social and cultural change legible beyond the kind of stage theories of change that say almost like a baby growing up into an adult, societies grow in this particular way. That's you know definitely not true. Um, instead, uh, and a way of thinking about social and cultural change that's also not, you know, some crisis happens and then change can occur, or certain key social actors, whether they're individuals or movements, change society and culture. Both of these are important, but there's a broader context in which we can think about social and cultural change coming from evolution. And so by culture, what I mean here is that this is an extremely multifarious term with dozens, hundreds of definitions. I just mean a shared regularity in the organization of experience or the generation of action that's acquired through our social life. So the very, very broad understanding. If you want to read uh, a little bit more about my work along these lines, um, I have a couple of papers. Uh, one is published. Uh, one is with my really uh, wonderful student, Bernie uh, Koch, and uh, an evolutionary biologist. That's what I'm going to tell you a little bit now. And the, the basic furniture behind these theories is that we have some complicated mixture of what we call personal culture. That is the parts of culture that are in our heads, our mental representations, the parts of culture that are out there in the world, the cultural things, the things that we produce on the basis of those representations, the practices we do, material, physical objects, books, records, etc. And then the cultural forms, that is the kind of genres that those things fall into, the more sort of abstract things that organize public culture. And cultural change most generally is really about changes in personal culture and changes in public culture. And in this empirical illustration, I wanna focus on changes in public culture. And the case I want to tell you about is gonna seem a little crazy um, and it's uh, heavy metal music. So why would you study metal music? Um, well, my student, Bernie, is interested in this, but uh, it's also theoretically interesting for two reasons. One, it's a form that involves a lot of actual, uh, that's not just economic in nature. This is something that people do for fun and uh, for the passion of producing it, not just as a kind of commercial endeavor. And the data are incredibly high quality and incredibly complete. So we draw on something called the Encyclopedia Metallum, which is the uh, roughly contemporaneous with the birth of Wikipedia, a huge uh, 
user created and curated record of all metal music uh, since its inception. And the basic ingredients in change are birth, how one thing produces more things, and death, how something goes away. And so what we do in this work is use this incredibly rich data to try to understand the drivers of birth and death. I'm leaving out the sort of third demographic process of migration, like how bands or uh, people move from one genre to another or into metal out of other things that partially has to do with the kind of data we use, but um, the kinds of evolutionary mechanisms that uh, we can explore and compare are things like mass extinction. Does something new arrive that leads to a massive spike in the death rate? Uh, and then after space has been cleared out, you can think of like, you know, the comet hitting uh, Earth 65 million years ago and wiping out a vast amount of terrestrial life and making room then for mammals and us to eventually to diversify to fill that space. Mechanisms like competition, which say there's a certain amount of room for things like this. And as the population of things like this grows, the birthday rates represented in blue and death rates represented in red are eventually going to converge as it's harder and harder to make a viable thing. And so, you know, you start to get fewer and fewer new lineages emerging and uh, lineages dying at a little bit of a higher rate. Evolutionary mechanisms like innovation, which is basically saying, I figured out some new way to be in this space. And that increases this Thing, the carrying capacity, which says how many entities of this kind can exist. Uh, and so in that case, you can see this sort of spike in the birth rate and drop in the death rate as that pressure of competition is relaxed. And then exogenous forcing, which means some trend, you can think of that as in the case of living species, it might be the temperature. In the case of music groups, it might be you know, the popular music uh, reset, like the commercial viability of music of a particular kind, that dynamic drives the birth and the death rates. So, you know, here we have mass extinction through grunge music, competition between bands, key innovation like the discovery uh, or the invention of new subgenres and popular uh, consumption as a sort of illustrators of these different mechanisms. So now here's the part where I'm just going to show you a bunch of slides very quickly in the interest of time um, and essentially narrate what these slides are telling us. So by using machine wow. learning methods that are adapted to kind of help us pull the signal out of this very uh, rich but noisy data, we find that there's no quantitative evidence for a mass extinction story. The birth rates uh, or the death rates don't spike as in mass extinction. We don't have the situation where a, the birth rate suddenly plummets and then grows up again, nor do we find quantitative evidence for competition. So the dotted blue line and red line are showing you what actually happens. The solid lines are showing you what would happen under a model learned from the data in which just competition happens. There's some fixed carrying capacity and we're competing for it. And you can see that we're not doing a good job modeling the actual trajectory of rates over time. Innovation, once we put uh, innovation into the model, we do a much better job capturing this trajectory in the birth uh, rates over time. And what's really important is that innovation relaxes the competition by expanding the carrying capacity. And we can actually figure out how that carrying capacity for metal music has changed over time from the data. And finally, we can reject a kind of crude economic story that says it's all about 
popular music trends. Um, niche expansion is uh, through the invention of novel subgenres is the essence of that story. And so we look at a bunch of different uh, all of the different subgenres of metal music and show that they kind of unfold in the ways that this theory would predict. And then we're actually able to uh, forecast the eventual convergence of birth and death rates, uh, or rather our theory predicts that birth and death rates should eventually converge. And so when we analyze the data from like the whole um, period almost up to the present, that is indeed uh, what we see. So, okay, uh, Pamela, if I may, I have maybe like five more minutes of, of stuff, is that, okay. So um, this framework, uh, this evolutionary framework is very broadly applicable. We apply it to bands, but it can be applied to firms. It can be applied to states and kind of kinds of states. And in general, this evolutionary way of thinking helps us to think about change and think about radical novelty, uh, not that, you know, in the metal music case, the things that would be truly radical novelty are things like grunge music, the invention of like entirely new forms, but this evolutionary framework really clarifies the way that we think about how change happens and what occurs when new things are introduced. And it also allows us to imagine a social science in which we can imagine paths from what is to what could be. Okay, so the last part, innovation relaxes competition by expanding the carrying capacity. And this is a very special case of a much broader process, which is called niche construction. And this is the third theme that I want to talk about today, reimagining the social through this idea of construction. So to make sense of this idea, we have to go back to a kind of high level for a moment and talk about the notion of adaptation. Adaptation is a special kind of computation that leads to a greater fit between the system that's adapting and its world. So we can think about uh, adaptation in the language of evolutionary dynamics and the level language of Bayesian inference. We can talk about a neural network adapting to the data it encounters, but all of these things leave out a key mode of adaptation. Adaptation really has two faces, and one of them is forgotten. The two faces of adaptation are, on the one hand, learning, and on the other hand, construction. Learning is where you figure things out about the environment, and you're able to survive better because you've learned things. Construction is where you modify the environment so you can live better in it. Construction is action that changes the environment, whether you're talking about beavers building dams or humans building cities, so we can live in places like, um, you know, Calgary or, you know, people uh, building, mo modifying their environments so that we're able to uh, live more easily in those locations. And that's something that humans are extremely good at uh, and do uh, pretty promiscuously. So as we know from all of the modification we make to the environment, that has consequences for the constructing an uh, organism or uh, system, but it also has consequences for others. So when that action that changes the environment is adaptive, it can make the environment more legible or more predictable. It can also change the behavior of other entities in order to benefit the constructing organism. So if those of you um, who maybe know a little bit about economics are familiar with the notion of mechanism design, which also has an IAS connection um, through one of the faculty uh, in the School of Social Science, um, Eric Maskin. Um, mechanism design is a special case of construction where the institution is set up such that the people acting in that institution produce particular outcomes. Um, construction can be a substitute for learning, right? 
when you change the environment to make it more suitable, you are also hiding aspects of the environment that don't need to be learned. And so, you know, I promised in the abstract for this talk that I was going to talk about things like power and privilege. And I think niche construction gives us a very interesting way to think about the phenomenon of privilege in that when the environment is largely constructed along the lines uh, that make it most legible to particular uh, groups and particular kinds of individual, that basically means those aspects of the environment, uh, there are aspects of the environment that don't need to be learned by those folks. And that's one of the, the um, forms that privilege can take. It can also be cheaper for powerful actors to use their resources to change the world rather than learn about it. And this is something that corporations do and nation states do. Construction is the essence of what we mean when we talk about power. It can shield aspects of the environment so we don't need to learn about it. It can be easier to change the world <laughs> than to learn about it. And we can exercise power by changing the very things that other agents are trying to optimize in order to survive. So what I want to suggest is that this notion of construction equips us with a sort of different and unifying vocabulary for talking about a lot of manifestations of power in the social sciences. So, okay, uh, wrapping up. Construction unites the social production of collective capacity with novelty. You collectively act to change the world in certain ways. That's the novelty side of things. It cre both creates and forecloses opportunities. And so I think that makes it as well a very valuable tool for us when we try to rethink the social in a way that orients towards future and perhaps more desirable social possibilities. So to return to the overarching theme, moving from studying what is to what could be this theme of reimagining the social, um, I want to note that although I've emphasized tools that come from mathematical and computational sciences, and this is in part because I am a quantitative social scientist, right? That's my background. It's also because I believe that these tools that I've emphasized are much more compatible with the way social scientists have thought, have theorized, and have imagined the social than the traditional quantitative and formal tools that we have as social scientists. This way of thinking that I've shared with you today embraces things like emergence, like collective capacity, like novelty. These tools allow us to cherish the possibility of agency and understand the weight of the social structures that we've built. And I think the rise of artificial intelligence is one of the most urgent reasons for us to reimagine the social and that social scientists can and should be involved because in a, a certain way, social scientists were the first AI researchers. How is that the case? We social scientists study what Norbert Wiener called machines of flesh and blood. And Wiener, uh, or Wiener has a beautiful book where he gives an extended discussion uh, that basically points out that, you know, organizations, when, I'll just briefly quote here, when human atoms are knit into an organization in which they're used, not in their full right as responsible human beings, but as cogs and levers and rods, it matters little that their raw material is flesh and blood. What is used as an element in a machine is an element in the machine. Whether we entrust our decisions to machines of metal or to those machines of flesh and blood, which are bureaus and vast laboratories and armies and corporations, we shall never receive the right answers to our questions unless we ask the right questions. And I would say social scientists know how to ask the right questions. We understand that our current social arrangements too often sacrifice our capacity as humans to bring radical novelty into the world on the altar of collective co-production and in the service of a certain narrow set of interests. We social scientists understand what is to imagine what could be. And I'm sorry for the kind of technical 
flip flops and I've tried my best to adapt to, uh, to, to, to those things, but I wanna thank the folks who have funded some of the work that I've told you about today. Most of all, the IAS, which has had such a profound impact on the trajectory of my thinking. And I wanna thank all of you for your uh, warmth and attention uh, on this day. And I will stop sharing my screen so that we can talk with one another. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Jacob, so much. I um, We had a couple of questions during your talk in the chat. Um, okay. And um, so I'm not sure I, I answered one of them from the notes that I'd taken, um, but it was from Carl uh, Feinberg who asked about the symbols. We went through that slide a yeah. little bit quickly. Um, remember there was S-A-R and then K-S-S. -S. Yes, so thank you for, uh, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out, uh, Carl. So just very quickly, S-A-R, S means the sit a situation. So like, you know, the story might be, you know, Goldilocks goes it out, just a very low, low stake story. You know, Goldilocks goes into the three, the, the house of the three bears, they're the three different porridges, you know, that might be the situation you're presented with a set of three choices. The action might be, you know, she chooses the one that's just right and the reward is, oh, it's a delicious thing. So S-A-R stands for what the situation is in the story, what the action is that the agent takes and the reward that they get. And that a turns reward. out- to be and that turns out to be all you need to sort of fit into then this whole framework of, of reinforcement learning and to allow agents to sort of choose between different possible courses of action in the situation. KSS is um, what's called a, a, a kernel function, a sort of way of evaluating similarity. So what that's saying is if I have a whole bunch of situ situate stories in my mind and I find myself in a real world situation, how do I decide what of the stories or memories I can draw on are more or less like this specific situation that I'm in now? And what I wanna emphasize is that it is not at all guaranteed that you and I will have different ways of identifying similarity uh, or difference. So you might think one fictional example is super salient to this situation. And I might know that same story, but think that it's not at all relevant. And that has to do with what aspects of the situation we judge as most salient for making those similarity judgments. So S is story and S prime is similarity. Ah, so, so S is the specific situation I'm in now, and oh, S uh, right, and S prime is the situation in a story. So when I ultimately make that choice, I have you know S one, S two, S three, S four, S five, whatever. I use this rule or this weighting method to say, okay, S1 is really similar to this specific situation I'm in, S2 somewhat similar, but a little more distant, and so forth. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question from Yvonne, um, was the January 6th Capitol riot guided by collective response to stories like the big lie and the QAnon conspiracy? Yeah, so, so I mean, that, that is certainly um, what <laughs> I think I was suggesting. Um, you know, I, I, and, you know, what, what I think is interesting to note in both of the case, the sort of examples I used, one being the, the Capitol riot and the other being the kind of GameStop you know, uh, Wall Street bets, et cetera. Like those are situations where a lot of people 
many of whom did not directly interact up until the sort of moment of action, ended up taking action that was quite coordinated. And one way to explain how they responded to a totally novel situation in very coordinated fashion is to say that when they were saying, you know, I'm in this situation, what do I do? They had very similar stories that said, in this situation, take this action and you'll, and I, I think you can look at some of the rhetoric that was used, for example, around the Capitol riot, where analogies were made to, you know, the American Revolution, you know, these sorts of things. People are drawing on these stories that say, this is the situation I'm in. And when someone who is in a situation like I am took this action, this is what happened. Or you can flip stories that say, if you didn't do this, then, you know, some catastrophe happened. So I, I, I do, I think that that is one way in which thinking in this vocabulary of stories can help us understand without appealing to a very elaborate machinery of people thinking through different possibilities, blah, 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 how you can end up with this highly coordinated collective action in novel situations. And this, you know, there's a, a, an interesting story about stories in the social sciences where, you know, there has been, in some senses, a long tradition of studying them. You know, you can go back to the kind of structural anthropology of Claude Lévi-Strauss, um, and in which stories are used to help us understand features of human culture and aspects of the structure of the human mind. Um, but particularly in, uh, in economics, it's only been very recently that stories or narratives more broadly have become appreciated as something that's really important if we want to ask these and, and build models of things like collective behavior. So, you know, some of you may have seen, you know, Bob Schiller, the uh, recent Nobel Prize winner, has this book, Narrative Economics, where he talks about how a lot of, you know, stuff that we see, for example, in financial markets is related to the diffusion of different stories um, and the, the use of those stories and sort of informing action that people take. It turns out that, and he, so he draws on these um, epidemiological models for like how stories spread between people. It turns out that just the little bit of extra complexity that I shared with you today in terms of um, what Carl was asking about, these sort of models of stories as situation, action, reward, triples, this notion that we actually have lots of different stories that we carry with us and different ways of judging whether they're more or less similar. The modeling challenge of what it looks like to say how and why stories spread and how and why they're able to guide select, uh, successful collective action, there is a lot of work to do in that space. In my office <laughs> over in West Building, there is, you know, a bunch of scrawling on my, I'm very glad that I have a chalkboard because I am, uh, as I guess befits my original training as a physicist, I'm someone who likes to think with you know, with chalk, uh, with chalk in hand. So there are a bunch of notes from when I've been like, oh yes, and then you know, you need to think about these X, Y. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? You can uh, either unmute yourself and um, or raise a hand. I will look through or put something in the chat. Uh, I could ask one question, sure. and that is um, just about your evolution from, um, you know, a, a physicist uh, 
to uh, what you're doing now? My, my, my personal evolution. <laughs> that is a very institute story, I must say. Uh, yeah. um, oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, no, so um, interestingly enough, a big part of it was uh, a story of, about stories. So um, when I was uh, in graduate school, um, so I started out actually you know, wanting to do kind of mathematical physics, the kind of very high energy theory, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was very fortunate to, to go to Oxford um, as a Rhodes Scholar, and uh, I worked with Roger Penrose um, there on um, a little bit on Prister string theory, which also has an institute connection, and uh, on, um, on some issues in cosmology. And uh, I eventually sort of came to the conclusion that that world uh, didn't, I guess, fit perfectly with my, both what I really took pleasure in as a scientist, um, which was using mathematics to try to, um, like, I would say I have a, a very, um, I like to go to uh, a terrain that's pretty unexplored and like try to break ground there. And um, so from that perspective, uh, you know, I found the, uh, and I mean, also to just be like perfectly frank, uh, as I'm sure uh, you know, any of the folks in the School of Mathematics or Natural Sciences will tell you, like, even if you are someone who is very, very good mathematically, people are differently good at different parts of things. And, you know, if you want to have a successful and thriving career, you have to be extremely good at the things that, you know, you're trying to do. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, the kinds of uh, mathematical uh, and formal thinking that is involved in being a string theorist was not, you know, taking the most advantage of my own strength. That was a place where I was relatively a bit weaker. And so I moved into an area called complexity science um, and uh, statistical physics more broadly, um, which, you know, is the use of physics ideas to try to make sense of um, collective systems. And in the complexity science version of it, it's, I mean, the shorthand description is physicists studying things physicists aren't supposed to study, like biological systems, like social systems, and so forth. And so when I was a graduate student in statistical physics at Calgary, I went to a uh, workshop that was basically meant to connect new fields at the university like complexity science. They started up a complexity science group and I had some collaborators that I'd actually met at a string theory summer school um, who started it and they suggested I come with them. So uh, in any case, the, the workshop was about increasing the dialogue between complexity science and the social sciences. And at that meeting, I met this guy, Art Frank. Um, and because I had a whole long standing interest in things like intellectual history and actually like literary theory and so forth, I was talking with him about narratives and stories. And he was like, A, that's something I'm super, I work in a lot. And we, so we had this wonderful conversation. And then he said, I'm teaching a course on graduate social theory why don't you take it and see what you think? And I was very lucky that my PhD supervisors essentially let me do whatever I wanted. Um, I can imagine many people who would be like, no, you can't, you're a physics PhD student. Why are you taking the sociology course? But I took that course and it was like a completely life-changing experience in which I felt like I had really found something that married all of the sort of things that I was both passionate about and good at. Um, and so I was very lucky then 
that because I was quite close to finishing my PhD and I was like, oh, I don't want to do like another PhD. <laughs> so I um, was very fortunate that I was able to get a postdoc at the University of Chicago um, in a sociology department that kind of rehabilitated me as a social scientist and I like learned how to be a social scientist. Um, and then super lucky that UCLA hired me despite the fact that I had taken like one sociology course ever to be a sociology professor. Um, so that's, that was a bit longer <laughs> maybe than you were asking, but that's the sort of story of how I ended up here. And I, in, in many ways, it's wonderful that I'm now finally thinking about these issues with stories and narratives um, that got me interested in sociology in the first place. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Robert. Well, uh, wonderful, uh, thank you so oh, much. Oh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you also for uh, you know being at least partly inspired by my, my column. I have a question for you um, in terms of um, this kind of theme that you uh, say that you're kind of moving into this kind of vast space of what's possible. So, I mean, almost like how are we going to sell, so to say, that kind of approach? Because I think, you know, if you, if you move into, say, very deep mathematics or abstract, there is a good um, sense of almost guaranteed returns, right? Because mm -hmm. whatever you do, probably there is some deep intellectual structure there. And so you're almost guaranteed to find something that is at least intellectually satisfying, although it might not be immediately applicable. Now, if you move into areas of great complexity, um, you know, you could end up in the swamp, you know, there could be nothing there. So there is, so, so I think one thing I'm, I'm struggling here, and we see this in many areas, we've seen this and we've seen this in the whole area of big data, of machine learning. There are certain parts of the landscape where you know mm. very fertile and you can find deep structures. There are other parts where people are just messing around and you know you find nothing. So I'm basically, you know, how are we going to uh, lead future scholars in those directions? What is your message to students? What is your message to funders? Um, you know, basically, we, we are not sure whether there is something to be found, to be honest, in terms of grand theories and concepts. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think my, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and thank you for writing that, that article, which, which was, um, uh, as you can tell, I had no idea that you were here. So all of the kind things I said about it were entirely and truly meant. Um, <laughs> so um, I think, you know, to me, the bottom line is to, is that I hope that we social scientists approach the problems of social science with the hope and expectation that there is something deep and profound uh, to be found there that has to do broadly with, you know, I would summarize, I was thinking recently, how do I summarize all of the things that I'm interested in? Because I also, you know, am very interested in and do some work in kind of artificial intelligence and so on. Um, and I have this Diverse Intelligences Institute. Um, all of that is unified by the question of under what conditions are complex wholes more intelligent than their parts? Or you can flip it around and say less intelligent. Um, and I think social scientists have historically, partially because we've gotten burned by a bunch of big theories that we've had that have turned out to be wrong, um, like these stage theories and so on, there is generally a certain amount of 
temerity about the notion that there is some deep general set of ideas, of principles. Law probably is not what we're looking for, except in a very meta sense. Um, but most fundamentally, I think we have to return to that aspiration. Now, part of what returning to that aspiration means um, is a, uh, you know, a certain amount of promiscuity in our use of uh, analogies and connections. And so that means that I, I encourage my own students um, to invest a lot in the kind of interdisciplinary contact that I was very fortunate to have as a graduate student, to have the kind of appetite for, you know, looking in potentially very disparate places, and to do the kind of work that, that I do, um, and that I think is part of, but not all of what this story has to look like, you know, that means being educated mathematically and computationally in a way that is not typical for, I would say, outside of some parts of political science and e economics. Um, you know, I, I think, as you maybe know, a lot of my earlier work had to, has to do, and I mean, some continuing work has to do with the sociology of science and with science policy. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of the message to funders, um, there is a need to uh, think about the risk reward calculus. Right. And, you know, I would claim, right, that if we are able to develop a set of principles of formal frameworks that are more expansive, more generous than the, the you know, ones that are available to us currently in the social sciences that draw on ideas from the theoretical computer science, ideas from machine learning and so on, that allow us to do a better job of forecasting what the properties of different social configurations look like, that give us a better understanding of how to get from some current state to some more desirable state that isn't, you know, more or less what we do now, which is, uh, either blind guessing or trying to optimize certain often very poorly calibrated constructs. I, I went to the after hours conversation yesterday, um, uh, you know, where uh, Florent Jani Catrice was talking about these measurement issues, right? Um, you know, if we had a social science that could do those sorts of things, that could allow us to act more rigorously, because like right now our, our medium for uh, imagining social possibilities in uh, are essentially narrative in form, right? We have these stories, these great, utopian imaginations, or we have a very restricted mm. way of exploring right around where we are. And what I, like, my dream is that we have a social science that, you know, expands this sort of penumbra around our current state to a much broader adjacent possible which might include different social arrangements. Now, how would that work like rigorously? What would the science of that look like? You know, I think it means examining many more forms of social organization for their formal properties, trying to understand them with the tools of, you know, I probably have the weirdest social science bookshelf, you know, anywhere, but like it, th these are, these are some of the books that I, you know, I brought with me to sort of think through, <laughs> right? Um, so it means using, in addition to the normal social science book, it, it means, you know, examining lots of different social arrangements beyond markets, scientific collaboration networks, uh, cooperatives, 
you know, collective aid associations in terms of their formal properties, um, trying to use these tools from TCS and machine learning and whatever to understand how they work and how they're able to carry out certain tasks. It means building experimental platforms that allow us to play around with those arrangements, um, whether that's with simulated agents, and that's something that I do some work with my students um, doing using multi-agent reinforcement learning, or um, building experimental platforms with actual human beings, <laughs> you know, um, who briefly or in a long durée fashion, I mean, not by Brodel's sense of long durée, but a relatively long time scale, play around in some social world that we've built to see if they exhibit the collective properties that we think should happen when you design arrangements with those properties. Um, and I think, you know, taken together, like broadening the scope of what we study beyond what social scientists have tr traditionally studied because of our very like Western European centric bias, um, approaching that study with the idea of we're going to try to extract formal properties and study things as computational objects and build, you know, building some of these things. And I, I think this is a place where I would point very directly to that essay of yours in terms of what does it mean to experiment and build you know, actually build some of these things. And we have seen experiments like this with, you know, the cryptocurrency world, Ethereum, you know, the smart contracts. There are, this experimentation is happening often in a more entrepreneurial way, um, often in a way that is somewhat distanced from mainstream social science conversations. And if we bring it more closely together, I think it, to me, that suggests that the risk reward calculus has got to tip over such that it, those are investments that are worth making, because that is the kind of social science that can guide us um, without abandoning the social science that we have and without abandoning the, the wonderful um, methodological diversity of the social sciences, which I, I think is incredibly important and I hope came across in the talk, probably not. Um, but uh, I think that's the sort of social science we need to, to most effectively chart our way through things like climate crisis, through things like yawning inequality, and so on in a scientifically informed fashion.